Hello and welcome to CS300 Software Engineering. Today I want to take a quick look at the portion of chapter one of our text that talks about software viewed as products and I want to sort of go over some of that and review it with you. I hope you're all safe and well out there during this difficult time. Let's just go ahead and dive in here. So, what the course text advocates is a view that's somewhat popular today, which is to think about the difference between a project, as we might have thought about it 10 or 15 years ago routinely, and still sometimes think about it today, and a product. And the book's view is that the modern version of software engineering is product development over project development. So to understand that, we need to understand what those two things are, what the difference is between them. So in particular, when we talk about project development, we're talking about gathering a set of requirements for a specific need for a specific customer, typically, building designing and building software for that customer and making sure it works for that customer. Product development's more general. We're talking about gathering a set of features to use as requirements. There's a lot of analogies between those two things. We're talking about designing and building a product that has the features we think work will work well for a variety of customers and then validating that verifying and validating that, that software works and that it is working well for our customers. So they're very related views, but in one case we typically have a specific customer in mind, and in the other case we typically have a general class of customers and target audience in mind, and that makes a lot of difference in how we build things. And so that's something we need to think about as we do this stuff. So what are the advantages and disadvantages here? Well, one of the arguments for doing things on a project basis is that when you have the specific requirements of one customer, when you're building a one-off system that is designed for a particular very specialized set of needs, software development's easier because it's harder to do general things than it is to do specific things. And in the product world, we've sort of fought back against that by building software products out of pieces that are very powerful and flexible instead of trying to scratch build quite as much stuff. But it's still a challenge for the product view. The other, th the other thing though, against the project thing, and this is a lot of the move away, is that if you can't amortize the cost of building a system over a bunch of customers, systems are very expensive. So like we talked about last lecture, in the real world, the systems are gonna be, need to be uh, built and tested and then once you've done that, once you've paid your upfront costs, you can, you give them or sell them to whoever, distribute them all around the world, reproduce as many copies as people can figure out what to do with for free. And so that idea of amortization, the idea that we take the cost of development and spread it out over a whole bunch of customers makes the per customer cost of the software incredibly cheaper. If you think about a modern 3D computer-aided design package, for example, that might easily be a $100 million piece of software to build. Nobody's, except the very largest companies, could possibly pay $100 million for a piece of 3, 3D CAD software. For a few tens of thousands of dollars, I can go out and buy a license for that software and use it. And because enough other people are, the software pays for itself and then some, the development pays for itself and then some. The next thing is that if the customer is the one driving in terms of what requirements the system has to specify, that makes things more challenging for the project centric, you know, for a software project, because the customer's needs are not gonna be conditioned particularly on what's easy for you or, and the customer's not gonna have a lot of insight into 
what's doable and how. And so, you know, there ends up tending to be a negotiation anyway around the customer says they want this and you come back with, well, are you sure you don't want this other related thing? Uh, you're really sure. And in the product space, it's easier because I can decide up front what I think customers might want. The other thing is that typically you're taking a big risk in the product space because you hope that the thing that you specify is something people actually will want, will buy or use or whatever. But on the other hand, the customer is taking a big risk in the project model because you they're counting on you to deliver what they asked for and they don't have any other way to get it then typically what happens is that you end up in sort of a contract driven model where the customer and you write a contract with all kinds of interlocking pieces specifying what you'll do when you'll do it by you know how to evaluate the result and that's a really good thing if you're going to do project based development but that makes the project very bureaucratic and difficult it makes it risky for you in a different way because you're trying to ameliorate the customer's risk so that's a thing of course, from the customer's point of view, having a thing built to their specifications would be better than having somebody's, you know, this is my my version of what you might have asked for product thrust upon them. And while customers will readily put up with it because it's so much cheaper, they're still going to have some bad experiences they wouldn't have necessarily had with a custom project for their stuff. You know, the mismatch between the features of the product and their requirements, sort of friction in which things are harder to do or take more time or take more equipment than they hoped they would, and the ever-present problem of lock-in in which the customer, once they've committed their organization to use your product, it can be very hard for them to get away from that, and if you're you know, unscrupulous or even negligent, you can take full advantage and really stick it to a customer who doesn't have other alternatives because they, in fact, are stuck with your product. Um, but of course, the bottom line is that if you're selling products commercially versus selling contract project work commercially, the products are just ridiculously more profitable if they're successful. An unsuccessful product sells you nothing, whereas a contract is fairly guaranteed revenue most of the time. But if you hit it big with your product, you can make insane multiples. And so people are very excited to sell software products. Now notice that either way, regardless of whether you do project-based development or product-based product -based development, at the core of what makes software engineering difficult is still requirements. How, what is it you want to build? And what is it you want to build? Like I said last lecture is the secret hidden peril of software development because way too often we build first without understanding what it is we're trying to build. And that almost always turns into an unmitigated disaster. So, if you look at figures uh, 1, 1, and 1, 2 in the text, they talk about sort of project-based software engineering as sort of a thing with, well, you'll notice the customer you know, is part of the mix. The customer describes a problem and helps to generate requirements, and the customer and developer work to require make those requirements in a form the developer can use. And when that's happy, then the software developer actually builds the software and the developer also helps the customer define the problem and the software helps with the problem and everybody's, so there's a supposedly a virtuous cycle here. But you'll notice the customer is sort of intimately involved. Contrast that with the sort of product-based software engineering cycle as described in the text in that you know, next figure. Um, here you'll notice it's, you know, in the words of Steve Ballmer, developers, developers, developers. It's really kind of a thing where the developer is talking to themselves. The developer sees what they think is an opportunity. They construct a 
bit of features that they think will hit that opportunity. They build the software and then they sell it to people. And the customer, you know, customer isn't anywhere here. The customer is out here somewhere uh, evaluating whether this opportunity really is something they want to be part of. And that's a really, that's in some ways a very similar view. It's a lot of the same activities. You know, we've relabeled uh, requirements to opportunities, you know, features to op requirements, and we've re relabeled uh, problems to opportunities, and that all sounds very optimistic, but really it's in some ways the same set of activities at the end of the day, but this different focus has all the advantages and all the disadvantages of sort of pushing the customer part way out of the loop. The customer has less feedback and insight into what's going on in development, and that can be a huge feature because customers are hard to work with, but it can also be a huge problem because now you're building things that maybe people don't actually want. So, the other thing that's come up in the last 10 years that this book's very eager to address, and I think importantly so, there's always, so we talk about the wheel a lot in the software industry and we have for generations, things go around and come back around. And you know, in the old, old days of software, software was mostly a service. You would by you would get access to a mainframe that was running some software and you would be a user of that software nobody had computers at home and there was no internet and so if you wanted software to run for you you went to where the computers were to some large extent there were teletypes and some things like that uh and then the microcomputer revolution came around and everybody's like well now we all have computers in our homes why are we you know we can run things for ourselves now. And so software products rapidly became a thing, right? We had these white box products going back as far as DOS, which I got in the old days, uh, that you paid money, you got a piece of software on a floppy, jammed into your computer and you were running your software. And then the internet came along another 20 years later and sort of turned everything around again. Now you have, with the internet and with the cloud, I was told by a NPR radio program that when you say the cloud, you are supposed to look up as though the cloud is up there somewhere. Um, with large server farms of effectively mainframe computers, maybe the, you know, certainly the trend has gone back the other direction a little bit. We're now uh, using the internet to connect to a remote computer that has some software as a service that we want to use. So this is the sort of trendy internet acronym of the week is software as a service, S-A-A-S, you'll see it written as, which is this idea that rather than having any software to solve your problem, you have access to services on the internet that solve your problem. And of course, depending on where you are in that spectrum, which is really a spectrum from producing a product to producing a service, there's different levels of it. And again, figure uh, one to th one, figures one to three, sort of 1.3 of this text sort of illustrates some places on that spectrum. You could be standalone, at which point you're just like the old days, just like I, when I was a kid in the 80s. You've got your user interface, your product functionality, user data all sitting on your computer, on your little IBM PC or whatever the modern equivalent is. And they still expect it to be connected to the internet because the thing we can do in 2020, we couldn't do in 1985 conveniently, is have the product automatically update itself for better or worse uh, whenever the product vendor has decided that it would be time to give you some new functionality, fix some bugs, uh, or try to do those things at least. And then on the far other end of that is the software as a service model in which case you don't really have much of anything. You got a browser, you got a mobile app sitting on your computer and your computer is essentially a fancy teletype from the 1970s, but it's got color and animation and the keyboard has more characters on it, I guess. And you have a mouse now, which wasn't a 70s thing. But you've got this computer with very limited user interface functionality, and then all the real stuff is on your vendor servers over here, and all the product functionality is there, all your data is there, 
And if that isn't a scary lock-in problem, you don't think that's a scary lock-in problem, you should be thinking about that. And then we have these hybrid models that sit in between. Maybe the user interface is on your computer. You've got some functionality locally. You've got your user data locally, maybe. <clears throat> maybe the server has user data backups because you wouldn't want to lose your data. Maybe product updates still come from there, probably. And, you know, maybe you can download from some kind of, you know, store or something your... Uh, additional functionality to make your product work better. There's all kinds of models in this space. It's not just these three things. It's every permutation you can think of as being sold by somebody. But that's a big change in software. It's something we're gonna to have to think about in this course. Uh, and when we say software as a service, one of the interesting things that's happened is that, you know, the browser as a primary user interface or the telephone, the mobile phone, smartphone as a primary user interface, tablets and, and smartphones together with the web are kind of taking over. Uh, I'm running on a desktop right now. That's what I'm giving this talk from. The desktop is to some extent a dinosaur. And one of the questions that we'll have to think about as we talk about software engineering in the context of the modern world is to what extent are these standalone products dinosaurs because they run on a dinosaur platform that barely exists. And maybe, maybe in a world where we're thinking about requirements as features instead, it makes sense to do the requirements a little bit differently because we're asking some questions that are more about products and sales than they are about needs and technologies. So the typical thing you do, whether you're doing a product-based development or a project-based development, is you would write some kind of white paper to start to scope the requirements. You'd say, in two or three pages of text, here's kind of what it is we think we need to build. And you'd pass that around, get comments on it from various people. If it's a project from the customers and the developers, if it's a product from potential customers and the developers, and you'd think about, is this what we want? And the book suggests there's sort of three fundamental questions, and I like this view to some extent, about the product. What is this product? And what makes it different? What differentiates it? That's code for, you know, what does this do that isn't already out there? Why, to what ex why, would I, why would I want this given the world of software as it is? And that's a super important question that's all too often missed. And it's one of the things I like about the product-centric view is that it's something everybody should think about when they're before they build a system. Who are the target users or customers, right? You're building the system on spec to some degree. You don't typically have any contract. And so you're you're hoping that there's a large base of people out there who are interested in what it is you're building that you can sell or give it to. And then the third question is sort of the question of the elevator pitch question of why would customers buy this product that's the book the way the book puts it why should customers buy this product what what does it provide that they would be willing to invest in and i'm going to say that the term buy here can be literal and often is it can also be sort of metaphorical why would customers trust their data to this product why would customers put effort into learning to use this product so even for me who's very open source heavy it's a question that can make sense to ask. The book cites someone named Moore and suggests that one template that you might do is this for sort of filling out what it is your product's going to be. And let me stop for a second here and point out that Templates and checklists, very, very popular in any kind of engineering, and certainly in software engineering, it's no exception. And, you know, these things can't be used completely lazy, lazily. You still need to put some thinking into what you're doing. But starting out with a practice you can follow, practices are the small P version of products, that says, oh yeah, we can do this thing, we can run through this activity or fill in this template or do this checklist or whatever to help understand things, and it's a process that automates things and reduces the amount of careful thinking we have to do and the amount of remembering we have to do and reduces our chance for mistakes. Templates are a good thing. So here's an example of a template. Uh, 
It says, well, if you're going to build a product, you should say, what customer is it for? What is it the customer needs? The name of the project? It, what kind of thing is it? Uh, what benefit does it provide? How is it differentiated? How is it unlike our competitors? So who's the competitor is the first question there. And maybe that competitor is the most prominent competitor in your product space. And the th way we differentiate ourselves is this. This is our differentiation. So that's pretty abstract. Let's fill it in with an example. Uh, I'm gonna skip around a little bit. I don't like the order I wrote these in. So here's an example of that. I wrote a project a few years ago that I'll talk about some in this class just because it's a fairly bog standard software project, which is an anagrammer. An anagrammer is a thing that takes a bunch of letters and tries to rearrange them into words in different ways. So there's hundreds of ways you can rearrange the letters of Bart Massey to form sentences. You could, for example, end up with as by master, which has all the same letters in it. Uh, creepily, if you rearrange Barton Massey, one of the many things you could get is Satan's embryo, which when I first saw that, I'm like, whoa, that's super creepy. Um, anyway, and you can guess maybe why it's called Sugar Mantra. It's written in Rust. Um, so I thought, oh, let's write a statement. You know, if I had, were starting this project now, how would I write this? I'd say, well, this is for computer puzzle solvers. They're the ones who are interested in having anagrams, and they need anagrams of a list of letters, because that is a thing you often need when you're solving computer, when you're using a computer to solve puzzles. Sugar Mantra, the name I chose for it, is an anagram generator. That's the class of thing it is. There are many out there, this one is mine. It's easy to compile, it's fast, and it's complete. So that's its feature set that makes it attractive. This is why customers might want mine. Unlike free web-based solvers, which are really my competition, this is an open source project written in Rust, and most of the solutions out there these days that are free solutions are web pages. Our product does multi-word anagrams, which is one of those features you'd think would be out there, but mostly isn't. Ours will take, you know, an arbitrary collection of letters rather than the letters of a single word and can be used with Unix tools. So, the, so I can use it at the command line. To do stuff so that's a more statement for my project and you know i look at this and think yeah that was a reasonable thing to build and that's the idea here the last thing i want to say is the thing i like least about this product-centered vision of software development is that software is actually still mostly not commercial if you go look at the statistics about sort of lines of code written per year most of those lines of code are not products. They are not software that's shipped. They aren't even services which are shipped. Most of the code written is still written for projects. That's written for business specific or highly customized enterprise apps that really do have a single customer and a very specific set of requirements. And of the stuff that's not like that, most of that isn't products either. A lot of it is, you know, open source. You can talk about there again, you can argue about whether open source is products or not, but it's stuff that the source code's put up on the internet and given away for free. And so the emphasis on sort of entrepreneurship or commercialism and money making software products, well, that's where a lot of the jobs are going to be. That is still a thing that exists out there. And, you know, the emphasis certainly on building software for software as a service situations where your product is actually a service and you're running it on your machines rather than the customers. That's certainly a thing that's out there a lot. And a lot of you will get jobs in one of these two categories. Uh, more of you will get jobs in software as a service companies like Google or Amazon or Slack or pick your favorite who you know, are selling services cloud services, that's where most of the jobs are right now. Some of you will get jobs building commercial products, although these days I don't hear too many anymore. The rest of you, a whole bunch of you will get jobs inside specific companies, um, companies in town like the, the trucking company we have that does a bunch of software for their trucking business, scheduling and truck management and stuff like that. And they don't really use off the shelf software, they use their own software that they've built. 
And so while we'll learn a lot about products in here, don't believe that that's all there is. And with that, I think that's a good place to stop. Hopefully this has been helpful for you. Again, please stay safe and well. Watch out out there in this difficult time. And thank you very much for listening. I look forward to talking to you again soon.